Hello everyone, this is Mike Bolin, Chief Analyst with Artillery. I recently gave a presentation at the Rocky Mountain Retreat to a number of executives, and I've reproduced that uh, presentation here for artillery readers, and it includes slides um, and audio voiceover. Um, it includes a discussion of AR and VR and a number of other emerging technologies. So please enjoy, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. After, um, I'm going to skip over my kind of introductory slide. If you want to know more about me, I'll, I'm glad to tell you all about it later. Uh, one thing I'll point out here is... Um, the, um, some of the places I'm writing for that are starting to skew towards a lot of VR and AR coverage and trying to build a knowledge base there. I'm very excited about that as a topic area. Artillery Upload and the VR AR Association, where I'm San Francisco chapter president, that's kind of a side gig. A lot of exciting things working in that area, um, which actually brings me to my first you know, big thing. Here are the, the five areas I'm going to go over one by one. Um, and again, I'm going to be doing this quickly. So VR, AR. Um, so definitions, you, you all probably know the basic definitions, but I'll set the table anyway. Uh, VR is kind of fully immersed experiences, it's very popular in uh, gaming, moving into entertainment and a lot of other areas. AR um, is um, less immersive, it's more of a graphical overlay to your existing field of vision of the physical world. Um, so for that reason, it's actually a lot more conducive to local, local discovery, local search, as I'll go over. Um, for those same reasons, AR is actually bigger. It's going to come later, but it's going to be bigger. Um, it's going to be a lot more applicable to a lot of uh, commerce, retail, uh, a lot of commercial applications. Uh, it's going to be big in enterprise and manufacturing and lots of things like that. Um, whereas virtual reality, due to its like more immersive state, isn't going to be tenable to be worn like throughout the day. It's going to be only really conducive to kind of short bursts of usage, whereas AR, because it's less immersive, is something that can conceivably be worn all day long. Um, so, so the monetization potential is just that much greater. Um, zeroing in on VR, one thing I always like to say is that we're at an iPhone 1-like moment uh, with VR. Um, few people often remember that the first year of the iPhone, um, there were only these 17 apps uh, which really kind of limited its commercial applicability. Now, one year later, when the App Store came out, we really started to see this open innovation, third-party um, creativity that really kind of sustained to this day in bringing us lots of like creative use cases that we didn't initially think of when the hardware was first um, developed. So building on that hardware, we saw everything from you know Uber to Pokemon Go. Um, so the the... the Historical parallel is we have a lot of innovation to look forward to in VR that builds on that kind of initial kind of hardware foundation. Um, now, right now, where we are in terms of that penetration of high-end um, VR headsets, we're now at about uh, 6 million units in 2016 sold. We believe that's going to grow to about 64 million by 2020, uh, which is great, but it really pales in comparison to the kind of existing um, kind of ubiquitous hardware, which is the smartphone, which is at 2.6 billion units. Um, so VR, though we're very kind of excited and bullish, um, is not going to reach that kind of next big thing status soon, just due to these sheer numbers of hardware penetration. So for that reason, um, you know, I'm recommending people that want to start to develop um, you know, experiences for VR to focus on, you know, and, and then building in this number right here to focus on mobile VR. And a mobile VR essentially uses the device you already have um, to essentially create a VR experience. Now, at first we had cardboard, which is a very rudimentary, dumbed down experience. Now we have these things such as Gear VR and Google Daydream that are a better or a good enough experience, but that can still scale to a lot more people. Um, and um, Daydream is actually my recommendation for anyone that wants to develop for VR and get that middle ground of good functionality, but also scalability and reach. Um, so the same is going to go for AR when it comes to that kind of mobile theme. Um, you know, we're not going to yet be in like a glasses-based ubiquitous situation. So in the meantime, the shorter term scalable opportunity is with the smartphone format. And we're already seeing a leading indicator of the consumer appeal of that. It's things like Snapchat 3D stickers and, of course, Pokemon Go. These are very primitive forms of augmented reality, but are things that um, are really kind of testing the marketplace's appeal for this. And the, you know, the lesson for local is this really could 
be um, kind of a new modality for local discovery, local search. Um, you could argue that this isn't new because we've seen this with things like Yelp's Monocle, which I believe was before its time. I, I think we're going to look back on Yelp Monocle as like the Apple Newton of augmented reality. Um, and I think like the Newton, all of the kind of other market factors that needed to be in place, the supporting technologies, the market acclimation, um, are, are now here where they are. Again, going back to things like Pokemon Go um, and, and really the systems to kind of deliver information in a personalized way. And that gets into the artificial intelligence that will drive a lot of this. So that's the, uh, the next chapter, AI. Uh, but less in kind of an augmented reality sense, the, the more kind of you know, current forms of AI that are kind of showing um, themselves are, are um, the kind of the field of personal assistant apps. So we have things like Siri and Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, and Microsoft Cortana, and a company called Viv that was recently bought by Samsung. Uh, so you have some pretty big giants backing these these companies, um, and it's interesting. They each each of these kind of different flavors of, of AI and personal assistant apps kind of mirror the strengths of, of the companies launching them. Um, Apple and Siri have you know, on-deck positioning on, on such a ubiquitous device as the iPhone, so that has certain advantages in kind of unearthing lots of things from your local calendar and, and you know, just being iOS-centric. Um, Alexa being very strong in anything commerce-related for obvious reasons. Uh, Google being kind of the, the gatekeeper to connected experiences and by, you know, serving as 15 years as the world's search engine has really built a lot of strong... Um, sentiment data and knowledge graph data that's going to really help its position with Assistant to be that really strong AI engine uh, to deliver stuff. So among all of those companies, I believe you know the strengths are held most by Google um, in terms of having that best knowledge position. I think this is going to be a war that is won on data instead of kind of bells and whistles or other things. And there, I think no one can really beat the uh, kind of the knowledge graph data that that Google has to really build an AI engine. But I think there are also um, interesting wild cards in this race, too. So, for example, um, the AirPods um, really kind of position Siri pretty strong. Um, and that's because, you know, I believe that if these things are sleek enough and small enough to engender a kind of a stylistic adoption and use case to essentially leave them in your ear at all times, which is yet to be seen, but if that happens, um, if that opens the door for a sort of ambient audio channel uh, to inform us about our surroundings, whether it be, you know, somewhere to eat lunch or, you know, the, who, the information about the person we're meeting with. I mean, we'll all kind of be like secret service agents with just kind of that intel being kind of whispered in our ear. Um, and I think that's important because the, you know, what it means for local is that, you know, there, there's a lot of location-based content that, that that becomes a delivery channel for. I talked earlier about augmented reality and how that could be a graphical overlay to inform us about our surroundings with location-based information. This could be a kind of version of that that instead of graphics is an audible overlay of information. Um, that, that could be an interesting channel um, for kind of delivery of this AI type content. And I think it's important to, to kind of handicap all of these players because it's going to really inform important decisions about where you all place your chips, where you're developing for. I think it's, it's kind of similar in historic perspective, you know, in choosing to build an app for iOS or Android, except now it's even more fragmented and more siloed. Um, in terms of kind of where to develop and where to kind of plant your seed in terms of the products you're building or what you're offering to, um, you know, your customers. So I think that um, is something that we're going to have to watch closely going forward. Um, building from that, voice search. These things are all kind of very voice-based, but instead of that kind of AI personalized kind of push-based intelligence, the near-term opportunity is with the, the pull, the, the search paradigm that's, that's really been successful, continues to dominate. But a lot of it is shifting over into voice as a modality. Now, um, t Google reports 20% of mobile searches are voice-based. My prediction is that number will reach 25% by the end of 2017. That's largely being driven by more mobile usage, in-car usage, where you know hands-free obviously makes a lot of sense, um, and the kind of IoT hardware, uh, such as Google Home and Amazon Echo, that's um, really conditioning users to use voice to search for things in the home. Um, so I think all of these things are, are kind of driving towards that trend. Now, um, what does this mean for local? I think importantly, this kind of changes the game for SEO, or at least the kind of 20 or 25% of queries that are voice-based change the game for SEO. 
just like we saw with the transition from desktop to smartphone, um, the calculus around the SEO and the kind of the search query styles, um, you know, being more location intent, um, in some cases being more specific. Um, I think we're going to see a similar shift when we go from taps to voice in terms of the kind of style of the way people speak, more natural language based, that in turn is going to require a shift in a lot of SEO strategies. So that's something to look after closely. In car media, so I, I just alluded to this. So we're at an exciting time, the cusp of, cusp of an autonomous driving kind of revolution. Um, and it begs an interesting question, which is what are we going to do in the car when we're no longer driving? And that has a lot of advertisers and media companies very excited about that kind of additional inventory or media time that that opens up. And um, the quote from Nicholas Gobert at, um, at here, he told me, if you think about it as an extension of your house or office, you're going to have more screen real estate to explore things. So beyond just autonomous vehicles, we're all being kind of driven around more, at least those of us that live in urban areas. I'll use myself as an example. I take Uber probably three to four times a week. Um, and that number continues to increase. Now, Uber did something interesting recently where their UI update uh, a few months ago started to create what, what I call in-ride mode. I don't think they've come up with a name for it yet, but it essentially takes over the app when the ride starts. It includes utilities such as maps, such as ETA, and they've even layered in some editorial content. And I think they're going to take that a step further with kind of premium content, um, you know, partnerships with Netflix or with HBO, uh, to kind of bring in premium content for the duration of your ride. I like to think of it like Southwest Airlines bring your own device uh, kind of in-flight portal for entertainment. Um, and from there, that's the kind of Trojan horse for kind of a compelling thing to do when you're in the car to then bring in lots of kind of directional advertising and promotions and sponsorship. Um, and we've already started to see it play with that idea with the restaurant guide um, that, that it's sending users. And if you think about it, Uber knows a lot about you to build a pretty robust profile. It knows where you're coming from, where you're going. Um, and I think there's a lot of potential there to do cool things. Um, what does it mean for local? Um, I alluded to this a bit in terms of it raising the media time. So for a long time, we've had a very fixed pie in which, you know, different forms of media are competing. Mobile, desktop, traditional media. But that's a fixed pie per day, and it's a zero-sum game. Now, when the iPhone came out and it started the you know, smartphone revolution, we saw an inflection point where that pie grew for the first time in a while because we had those, you know, as Google calls them, micro moments where you're in line at the grocery store, you're on the subway. So I think we're now going to see for the first time in a while another inflection point where that pie once again grows, and it's going to grow to the tune of 26 minutes per day times two for the average American commute, which is going to be a media and monetization land grab um, for that time, and, and I think that has a lot of implications for local content, localized media, and advertising. Um, lastly, on-demand, or more specifically, the phase two of the on-demand economy. Uh, on-demand is a topic we're all pretty familiar with, so I won't belabor it, but you know, some of the things that started the on-demand movement still exist. Even though we've pulled back a little bit, they still exist. So mobility is there. Uh, mobile usage continues. We're treating the mobile device as a remote control for the physical world. That's very conducive to on-demand services. Generational factors. The millennial generation, I always joke that we're, it's in San Francisco where I live, um, the on-demand economy is essentially assisted living for millennials. Um, and the geographic, we have more people living in cities than ever before. Um, that creates a population density that makes these kind of network effects and these matching algorithms of supply and demand easier to achieve. So all of these things, you know, aren't new, but these continue to sustain the on-demand economy. What is new is we're starting to learn a lot of lessons in phase one of the on-demand economy, as I call it. One is that it works best um, in product categories where there's relatively interchangeable supply. So that's Uber. Relatively speaking, there's not a lot of difference between one Uber driver and the next. It's all about just finding you the closest one um, and the logistical system of routing you if you're in Uber Pool or something like that. If you compare that to something like home services, there's a great deal of nuance and variance and quality in all of the kind of categories and subcategories of service, everything from plumber to roofer to window repair. Um, and that fragmentation makes that network effect and that kind of matching algorithm um, harder to achieve. And that causes complexity, which leads to margin compression, and it's just very challenging. Another important lesson we learned 
is that you know leakage is a big problem. After you just connect buyer and seller, they will naturally be incentivized on the second and third transaction to go direct and cut you out as the middleman. Um, so the lesson is to provide enough value to justify your position as middleman. Um, a few examples of that are Uber. Um, they handle the payment processing. They handle getting you the closest ride and the logistics and connecting you with a rider going in your same direction. Lots of things that people love and justify the cut that it takes. Same with Airbnb. They create a secure environment with payment processing, with money they hold in escrow to arbitrate disputes if it comes to that, um, and providing really just a security blanket in a highly sensitive area, which is you know having strangers in your house. Um, or vice versa, staying in a stranger's house. Um, so these are the types of things that have you know, justified that position of middleman, um, which is just really a key success factor in on-demand. So lastly, what does it mean for local? Um, the question is really, you know, is this a new form of customer acquisition? What I mean by that is the traditional form of customer acquisition is advertising. It's an upfront ad buy or commitment to an ad buy in order to get customers. Now, um, the on-demand model, conversely, is to join a network as an Uber driver would do, and then instead of you know paying up front to acquire customers, you're matched with demand in real time as it happens, and then you pay as you go through a revenue share. So it's less upfront risk as an ad buy would be. Um, so, so is there appeal in that? Is the question. Um, and and what I always go back to is there's you know 150 million spent. Um, in localized advertising, uh, about 60% of that is SMBs. Um, SMBs, uh, there are 25 million of them in the U.S., only about 19% of those advertise. So the other 81% are not advertising for a reason. So is this kind of new model of customer acquisition an opportunity to broaden that addressable market to that other 81%, especially if you bundle it in a way that creates these kind of operational tools. Uh, we went over some of these yesterday. You know, moving the rhetoric beyond just customer acquisition to things like payment processing, like Uber does, or scheduling and booking, like Airbnb does, in an overall package that appeals to that broader swath of SMB better. Um, and I think that's still an open-ended question, but for a long time I've had the theory that the on-demand economy is gonna move up market from the 1099 workers to the SMBs of the world for all these reasons I'm mentioning. That hasn't happened yet, but I think it's an open-ended question and something that deserves you know, at least some, uh, some debate over. So um, that's it for me. Um, I'm available for questions, but hopefully this has been valuable. Um, I scratched over many of these, but I think we'll kind of have the chance to dig deeper in subsequent conversations. Thank you.